For those of us who had the good fortune to work for the Appalachian Mountain Club in the huts, the experience enriched us in many ways. It helped shape our personalities, and for many, it shaped and guided our careers. The hard physical work of packing, the daily chores of reaming the hut, cooking for huge crowds of hungry hikers, and answering their seemingly endless questions were tempered by the camaraderie we shared during raids, pack day excursions, and days off. At the annual Fall Fest reunion in November of 2018, a crew member from each of the decades, beginning with the 1940s, shared anecdotes and memories of their time in the huts. It was an evening of reflection punctuated with frequent laughter, where we looked back and took note of how much had changed and how much had stayed the same in AMC huts. Hello, I'm, I'm Tom Deans, and I'm very proud to have served in the huts from 1956 to 1963. Um, I believe, as I looked at, at going over notes for this, that the late 1950s represented the end of an era which I think of as the Joe Dodge era. That was really the time that uh, Joe really built the hut system and instituted many of the things that, that became the legacies of, uh, of the AMC hut system. I was lucky, and when Ken brought this picture up, in the middle there are three Greenleaf hutmen with, with two ducks. Those were my ducks from Bitterford, Maine, that Dick Maxwell decided he wanted to bring up to Greenleaf and put in Eagle Lake. So he packed the ducks up, and they the plan was that they were going to eat them at the end of the season. And they chickened out. They, they, and he packed the ducks back down, and the ducks came back to me. So those, those ducks went to Greenleaf and came back to Biddeford. Well, the reason I tell this is that Dick Maxwell lived next door to us in Biddeford, Maine. And when I was 11 years old, he invited me up to Greenleaf Hut. He wrote Joe and said, I want Tom to come up and spend some time with us. He really loves the mountains. So I went up to Greenleaf and I went up for two weeks and ended up spending four weeks up there at Greenleaf when I was 11. And after that, beginning when I was 12, I wrote a letter to Joe Dodge every year saying that I think I should get a job in the huts. And he would write me back and say, we don't take anybody under 16. And so I would write the next year and the year I was 15, I had written him, <coughs> written him again, and I hadn't heard anything, and I was sitting at the, uh, the dinner table in Bitterford, just, the school year had just ended, uh, and uh, my mother came and said, Joe Dodge is on the phone. And so I went to the phone, and he said, Tommy Deans, where are you? I said, Joe, I'm at home. He said, well, get the hell up here. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I was hired. <laughs> For the next 33 years, I worked for the Appalachian Mountain Club, but Joe hired me that way. That was my hiring. Uh, and as you can imagine, a day later, I was doing pots and pans at Pinkham Notch. We had a wonderful crew in 1956. Uh, Judy uh, George Stevens uh, was our hut master, and there are two members of our crew here tonight, Mary Sloat and Barbara Douglas. Please use our... One thing I want to show you, I, I, I brought show and tell today, so this is, um, my mother very nicely sewed my windbreaker in 1956, uh, and this is all the original hut patches from, uh, from 1956, including Evans Notch Hut, 
which uh, some of you remember. And I did work at Madison that summer for a couple of weeks when, uh, and, the, and the hut patch was there. So I, that, that's just a piece of memorabilia. Maybe I'll give it to the, the, uh, the archive place out here. Then I went to, to Greenleaf Hut in 1957, which is where I really wanted to be. We had a great crew that year. Joe Harrington was the hut master. Roger Hart uh, was the other crew member along with me. Uh, and uh, we had such a good time together, we asked Joe to please let us come back to Greenleaf, the three of us, the next year. And I think it's one of the only times in the huts that three, uh, and it was only a three-person crew at that point, uh, that we worked two years in a row, the same three guys at the, at, the, at the same hut. But we had a great time. Now, just a little footnote on Roger Hart. For you book collectors and all, I don't know how many people have ever seen this book. Four Against Everest. Yeah. Yes. yeah, some people have. Great read, isn't it? Yeah. Roger Hart, after he left Greenleaf in, in, in 58, uh, went to Tufts as a geology student. And Woodrow Wilson Sayre was a, a professor there. And he decided that, hell, you know, kept four amateurs could go over and climb Everest. He didn't know why everybody had to spend all this money and do all this crazy things. Well, these four guys went over secretly snuck in to, uh, to Tibet because they wanted to climb the north face of, of Everest, got up to the north call without oxygen, and ended up you know, falling. And, and it, it, you really should read the book. It's great. Uh, but this is Roger Hart you know, of Greenleaf Hut. And they, they caused an international um, uh, incident because the Chinese got all ticked off when they found out they'd snuck into China. And, and that was when things were really uh, tense over there. But it's really a wonderful story about Roger Hart and, uh, and their four against Everest. And I, I, I'm very glad to say it almost was five against, uh, for Everest because Woodrow Wilson Sayre came up to Greenleaf and took Roger and, and me down into the, we went into the Pemi and he said, wouldn't you like to come on this little trip with us? And I decided I better go to college and I think probably it's a good thing I did. <laughs> anyway, well, let's see. Uh, the, uh, I just wanted to talk about a few things. Packing. Uh, I happen to have my original pack board here. This, this is, and the reason I show this is that uh, this was 57 and 58. Hank, were you still using the freighters then, or did you have these pack boards? Oh, we had the regular old fashioned, the good ones. The good ones, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, th th this, this was the pack board we had. And it, 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 you can imagine, you know, carrying the loads you do today, all you young, energetic hut people with the nice tall backs, which I ended up having in later years. But to tie the loads on, and you had to go far above the pack board, many times you would lose your load part way up. Just be, I see some Willie Ashbrook, I see you nodding your head. You'd lose your load because you know it was hard to tie the darn thing on. And somebody over, I think it might have been Bruce Sloat, somebody figured out that, hey, let's build a taller pack board. We did have the donkeys about once a year over at Greenleaf, and they always had a hard time on first agony. And uh, many times, they wouldn't make it up first agony if it was really slippery. So they'd leave all their loads down there, and we'd have to bring them <laughs> up to the hut. But the, uh, the donkeys were coming up and close to the first agony when a terrible thunder shower came in. And they panicked, and they all ran down the bridle path and dumping loads, and, and the mule skinners came up and said, hey, come down and help us. You know, there are loads all over the place. So we went down, and we were picking up the loads, and they got down to the bottom, and the, the donkeys were all around route, six, uh, route 3 and over in the Lafayette campground, and they rounded them all up, and they said, hey, one's missing. Trigger was missing. And so, was, they looked up and down the road, and for the next couple of days, everybody was looking, and we're packing, and they said, God, there's an awful smell right up here beyond a halfway uh, rock. And, and uh, uh, sure enough, uh, I can't remember, I think it was Joe, I, I can't remember who went down, but we found Trigger had fallen off uh, one of those steep rocks just beyond halfway, and had broken his neck, and had died. And so, uh, 
I was told to go down and bury the donkey. <laughs> and uh, do you ever try to bury a donkey on the side of a mountain? <laughs> well, the end of the story, and I don't really think I've made this up in my mind, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is accurate. I was down there sweating in a smelly, awful place with no dirt at all to throw over the donkey. And this little woman up on the trail came down and said, hey, mister, what are you doing down there? And I said, I'm digging an asshole. <laughs> You know, it, it, um, I, I think of the helicopters in the, in the presentation earlier about helicopters. Uh, you know, the initial uh, uh, supplies, everything we'd get, you'd get the initial delivery over to the pack house, and you'd spend the next month, uh, three of you, packing up all the supplies. The worst pack load I ever, are the jerry cans full of gasoline uh, for, the, for the generators. That damn stuff, uh, you know, you, uh, you, we used to try the darndest to get that top on as tight as you could so it wouldn't leak. I swear the thing was built to leak. And you'd get part way up and the gas would be running down your back. And it was really, it was really brutal. But anyway, that's, uh, but we had, we had the, the electrical uh, generator out there and we'd turn the lights on at, you know, at dusk and then turn them off at 9.30, 10 o'clock and, and uh, uh, made a hell of a lot of noise. Noise, but there, there it was, the generator. The, the water pump was uh, about three quarters of a mile down the Greenleaf Trail at a very poor spring that uh, we used to pump the water up from uh, and into the, as Hank was saying, we had the big tanks up in the poop deck and, and they'd get down low and you'd run down the Greenleaf Trail and turn on the water pump and, and uh, fill up the, uh, the water tanks again. Uh, cooking, uh, we had uh, a wood stove at Greenleaf Hut in the, in the kitchen. We, uh, we, we cooked a lot in those years, in 57, 58, on the wood stove. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever, Hank probably has, baked bread in the wood stove. It's not the easiest thing in the world to get. Oh, you, you, oh come on. You, I, <laughs> you had a better wood stove than I did. <laughs> because I, well, what, what we did uh, was, you know, Hank mentioned the 38 hurricane. Uh, for many years, uh, the, whole, the whole slope from Greenleaf to the, down the Greenleaf Trail was all blown down. It was all blow down and, and dry timber, beautiful for, for firewood. Well, in 57 and 58, we had to start going up, up toward the, uh, the uh, uh, top of the mountain over the first little knoll beyond, uh, beyond the lake. Uh, going up to the summit of Lafayette, and it was a, there still is a big blowdown in there, and we used to cut wood up there and pack wood down to the hut for the wood stove. Now, uh, you, you, all you new hut people have you know, nice wa hot water heaters and everything. We had a good hot water heater too. Uh, it was known as Sammy. This is Sammy. How many people remember Sammy? You know? Okay, hey, here's Sammy. I got a real Sammy. Bruce gave me this. It was a precious thing to have hot water. One of the things was we didn't have showers, uh, of course, uh, uh, then. And one of the, the officials of the AMC came up, and um, I guess they were a little concerned that Tom Deans hadn't had a shower in, in probably three or four weeks. And, and he sent me something a week later. Uh, he sent me, a, you, you all remember S.S. Pierce, right? Okay. He cut some holes in the bottom of it, and he said, Tom, you hang that outside, and you pour some water in that, and you, you stand under that thing and take your shower. So that's, I, I saved that as a souvenir. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, uh, the gaboon digging at Greenleaf, I think, was a little more difficult than at Galehead. Probably not much, but I'll tell you, to try to, you know, we, you know I, when I say the end of an era, the things we did, as my environmentalist heart dies today to think what we did, we threw everything out there in the pucker brush. You know, I, I could show you some places to go look for things today. I, there are lots of stuff out there. We had, uh, we had the, the old uh, chemical toilets at, at Greenleaf and, uh, uh, with a big, long uh, 
uh, barrel underneath the, the toilets uh, with a, uh, an extension outside so the crew could go out and lift the cover up and pour in chemicals and with your little hoe, uh, hoe things around in there to stir things up so you could use it a little longer. Uh, uh, and, and then you just pulled the plug at the, at the bottom and shot everything down towards e Eagle Lake, uh, down over the bank. That's where, where all the waste went. And, and you know, I, <clears throat> so, you know, you've noticed the pond lilies in, in Eagle Lake. Have you all seen those pond lilies? Well, a lot of those were due to the many years of uh, straight piping uh, to, uh, to Eagle Lake. Now, I've got to tell you one story about those, those toilets. I, I said there was a little uh, opening out back where we had to reach in and, and, uh, and clean things out. Well, Roger and I decided that um, uh, it'd be fun with some of the girls' camps that came along, that we'd give them a little excitement. So we got a two by four and, and put a couple of holes in there and had uh, some long fused uh, firecrackers. And we stuck firecracker in, in, the, in the hole, lit them, put them in, put it in the, in the, in the uh, crapper barrel and pushed it towards the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the bathroom and put the lid back on and then about three minutes later, kabang, and you know, if somebody was on there, you really got the, the <laughs> thrill of a lifetime. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so let, let me wrap up with, uh, with 19, 1959. I, I worked uh, opening and closing crew at, at Greenleaf uh, because I took a trip out west with my family uh, during the middle of the summer. And uh, I went up in, in late August uh, and uh, Labor Day, the crew left. Uh, and I, and, the, and the, closing, the rest of the closing crew was gonna come in on the next Saturday. And one thing I'll always remember, uh, they left uh, Monday uh, noontime or so and I didn't see another soul until the next Saturday. Four days on Mount Lafayette all by myself without, without another person. And I, I, I don't, I'm sure it could never happen again ever, but I was there for four days putting shutters on and getting the, the, the hut ready for it to close down. Now fast forward to August 2018. Penny Deans, who's also an OH, uh, and I, 59 years later, we drove over to spend, we went up to, to Greenleaf to spend the night the uh, first weekend in August. Got to Franconia Notch, and I had to drive down the highway about a mile, almost about halfway down to the basin to find a place I could pull over on the side of the road to park. All the parking lots were full. You couldn't uh, get in anywhere. And we walked up the bridle path and it was two-way traffic almost the whole way up the trail. I could not believe it. I mean, and I say that, and when I got up to the hut, I looked in, in some of the, the registers, uh, and the number of goofless nights we had in 1957 and 58, when we had nobody at the hut, there, there must have been at least a dozen nights where we had nobody at the hut. And I, I, I was just sitting there thinking, my goodness, what a change. And you young folks today that, that deal with the crowds and, and all the education and other good things you're doing, it makes my heart feel good. But I, I'm glad I was there in the 1950s too, because it was fun. <laughs> Thank you.